Um, I don't usually normally use these things, so if my uh, voice is going in and out, it's probably because I'm doing this instead of doing this. Uh, so just, uh, I usually, we usually see, I was already doing it. Um, this is actually where we do all our company meetings. Uh, and so I'm used to actually projecting without using this, but I've been told I'm supposed to use this. Justin, do I really have to use it? All right, anyway. Um, so project process. Uh, uh, it's, this is uh, a sort of, I've, I've given this speech before. Um, it's actually, I've kind of updated and modified it a bit. Uh, it's really based upon just a lot of thoughts that I've had and we've had here at Obsidian um, over the course of 10 years, because we've been around for 10 years now. And then uh, over the course of before that, probably other, the other, other 10 years that I've been in the industry. Uh, and so a lot of it just has to do with like a lot of mistakes that we've made and a lot of how we try now to think about projects. Um, you know, uh, for you, for those of you who've been around for a long time, you know, you know, back in the day, uh, projects were like, hey, let's make a game, and uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. We had no, you know, no experience, no knowledge, no nothing. We just sort of started making games. Uh, and I know some of the people in the crowd, of course, <laughs> are very aware of that. Anyway, so, uh, so here's the here's the kind of the. Uh, the dumb way of starting up a, a PowerPoint is sort of define a pro define kind of what you're talking about. Uh, obviously, here is what, you know I just kind of put the definition of process. Uh, ultimately, because I really think that's what a project is all about. A project and making games now is a process. Now, even when you have five people working on a game instead of 60, 70, 80, or as Ubisoft has said with uh, when it comes to uh, uh, Assassin's Creed 4, they have a thousand people. I have no idea how you manage a thousand people, uh, but um, uh, but I you know they have of course over the years put a lot of the process and things into into place to make that possible. Uh, so. We just have recognized that when we are following process and we are paying attention to what we're doing, we do a lot better than we're just when we're just being chaotic and random. Uh, that seems to be common sense, but I think even for us who've been in the industry for a long time, we can sometimes fall back to, oh, well, it worked before, or well, it's working now, so let's not think about it too much. We'll just kind of keep on doing it. Uh, and that's usually when we kind of fall into kind of our worst points of, in a project because suddenly things aren't working and uh, we need to figure out how to make them work. Um, you know, and when it comes to project process, you know, there's a lot of different terms. You know, I, I kind of listed a whole bunch of up here about blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, as, a, as a kind of, if I, if I have to look at what we do here at Obsidian, uh, what we really do is, uh, the best way to put it is, we use a modified agile, is probably the best way to put it, uh, from the standpoint of, we really start off more agile when we're in pre-production. When we go into production, we're sort of a combination, we're probably more waterfall, uh, and then we're probably pretty, we probably are, go back to being a little bit more agile in post-production because at that point it's just about how best to use your time to get the game tuned, good, and out the door. <clears throat> so really what we've noticed the most, of course, over the last 10, 20 years is that, and it kind of goes with when we're following process, our teams are doing great. Uh, when we're not, they're not doing so great. And it's amazing, I've looked at some of our teams in the past of how much they've actually, how much they've been able to get done in a short period of time. Um, you know, a great example of, of is KOTOR 2. Uh, of course, online there's some feedback about the end game and stuff like that. But in the end, we put together a, with a, with a relatively small team. Remember, I was probably in the low 30s uh, in, in, let me see if I get my timelines right, in less than 18 months, uh, we put an 80 hour game together. Now we did start with technology and of course we used a lot of assets, but still that's a pretty small team putting a lot of content together. Uh, and a part of that is because it's the type, of, type of game that we've made in the past uh, and we really followed a process to get that done. So um, the other thing, I, I, actually I should have said before I started this out, is that I am happy to be interrupted. Um, so if you have a question as I'm moving forward, just ask it. Um, I am, this is, you know, I'm a producer, so yes. What inspired you to want to make Obsidian? What inspired us to make Obsidian? Uh, so, uh, that's, well, I guess it's complicated and not complicated. Uh, you know, the, the very easy answer is that for us, uh, we were all work, a lot of us were all working at Interplay. Uh, and, and we were working for a part of Interplay called Blackout Studios. Uh, Blackout Studios for, was responsible for internally the initial Fallout, so Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. And then we worked with Bioware externally. Uh, and, uh, and we did Planescape Torment internally, and we always worked with another studio called Snowline Studios externally on, a, on a, a PlayStation 2 action RPG called Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. And so Interplay, it's always a hard way to say, how do I say some of these things? So 
with Interplay, uh, Interplay was doing very well in certain ways, very poorly in other ways. Uh, Black House Studios was doing very well. Every product we did uh, was profitable, uh, but unfortunately a lot, all our profit went to pay off things that were not successful. And really what was happening to us is every single timeline and every single budget was less and less and less. And it became increasingly harder to, and as games needed to be bigger and bigger and more complex, uh, it, we just were, it was just a huge challenge. And so really what we saw, uh, a number of us, we really saw that the writing one was a little wall is interplay was going like this and it just wasn't, it wasn't gonna rebound and, and that's what happened. And so really what we decided to do was we said, it wasn't so much we we didn't have this sort of philosophy of like well we you know like we're gonna go make amazingly different games and run our company amazingly different and all that kind of stuff. Really, we just wanted to make games, and there was a challenge in interplay at that time to even just do that. And that's ultimately that's really what the impetus that got us out of it. So uh, anyway, so really you know my, my whole thing about process is really about about the teams. Teams can be, as I say, amazingly productive or amazingly productive. Uh, so really, what's my first point? Uh, the first thing is, uh, when it comes to teams, uh, and it comes to projects, no one thing works. So there is no silver bullet, there is no nine women making a baby in one month, there's, there's, there's <laughs> none of that, right? It's just, it's just not what it is. It is a, games are amazingly fun to make and be involved in, but it is an eat your vegetables thing. It is a, you, you, you make, awesome things because of hard work and because of being attentive to details. Um, and the other important thing is, even if you find something that's gonna work, uh, it's like, wow, this is working. It's like the stock market, or it's my dad. My dad loved horse racing. Now, he didn't like, he wasn't like, he wasn't like the de track dad that went out there and, and spent my inheritance on, on, uh, on, on betting on the horses. But what he did is he felt like, wow, there's, there has to be some not randomness to this that I can come up with a system. And he did, he came up with systems. He was, he was, uh, he was an engineer by training, uh, then he, he then was a fire, uh, fire protection salesman, which probably sounds kind of boring in a lot of ways, uh, but he got to go to the most interesting places in the world. He did fire protection on the Alaska pipeline. He did for the B-2 bombers. He did it for aircraft carriers. He actually did it for the original UCI computer lab, uh, computer labs or one of the big mainframes there. Uh, he put in the Halon system in there. And so it was a super interesting thing. Um, but anyways, that was just a little bit on my dad. So, uh, but more importantly, um, when it came to sort of his horses, he would get something to work for like three months or half a season or while they were at Del Mar or while they were at, uh, I think they go to the, it's, I, I think they go to like the LA, uh, the, the Los Angeles County, um, uh, the, 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 not the farm thing, anyways, the fair. They go to the fair for whatever number. So he would get to work and then it wouldn't. And I think that's a big thing about projects is you can get some system to work, uh, but it's only gonna work for a while. And you have to be, particularly for people who are running projects or senior people on projects, you have to be always attentive is like, so we have the system and it's working, you know, our meetings are working right this way, our tasking system is working, this is working, that's working, or just whatever, in any of the game, but being very attentive to, is it still working? And that's the question we try to ask. Um, so, so in my mind, what does work? Um, so this is, I, I say passionate groups with clear goals. And this actually applies to a lot of different things. I, I know this is the silly Mass Effect cosplay, cosplay thing, but you know, what I'm always amazed by this is like, I am just amazed by people who can put in the time and, and create these things. I am, I, it's gonna sound really strange. I, at least from like a visual artistic standpoint, I am not a creative person. So I look at this and I'm like, I just, I couldn't even ever, you know, think that I could put something like this together. So, but these people probably in their spare time, hopefully in their spare time, um, <laughs> it, have, put these, have put these costumes together and got in this group shot that they look like the characters from Mass Effect. I mean, that's amazing. And what we've really noticed, even with our big teams, is we bring our big teams down to small groups of people that are passionate about the part of the game that they're working on, and then they have very clear goals. And I'll kind of talk a little bit more about what we mean by clear goals um, a little later in here. Um, because when, when a group understands what they're trying to accomplish, and it's not 50 people, because that's the real challenge with any kind of game. Um, and that's really why you see when it's a small group of people, like five people fo focusing on an iOS game, Android or game, that they can be successful because it is, they all get it, they all know it, they're all talking about it. So really, as soon as a game, I mean, I, I don't know if the number, as soon as you get a team that's bigger than five, you need to start splitting into smaller groups, that's probably 
the wrong number, but it's something to really think. But it's 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 one of those things. As the numbers get bigger, people need to split be split down. Um, so uh, you know, I, I can't remember. This is a Lamborghini or Ferrari. I think it's a Lamborghini. Yeah. So because uh, that car just that car just looks cool, you know. And it, and it's the thing about it's thing about an Apple product, or you know, hopefully not just historically about Apple products, um, but even now, you know, this idea that you just feel the product, it just feels good, right? And and it's, it's making sure, uh, now Lamborghini in the end is probably a bad example because in the case of Lamborghini, money is no object, right? It's like, oh, it's gonna cost $2 million to just figure out how to make rims for this car. Uh, they don't care because they're gonna get someone to pay three, four, five, six, seven hundred thousand $700,000 for the car. Um, but when it comes to quality in games, you know, a lot like an iPhone, like I bet there was a design of an iPhone in which there was four buttons on the front at one point and they came down to one. You know, and they're like, because we can figure it out. It, it feels better. It makes interacting with it simpler. Because in the end, quality is more important in a game than more stuff. And that is really what's I think the most important thing. And that is hard for us because we make role playing games, and role playing games have a ton of stuff. So if a lot of people look at where we have failed as a company, and we failed, and fail is probably hard, harsh term. It's how I think of it. But um, where we have not done the best to our ability, it's because we've tried to do too much. When you try to do too, too much, you, you're not focusing on quality, you're focusing on quantity, and that's not what players want. Players want a great game experience. They don't want just more. Now, there's some caveats to that, just because, you know, someone will raise like, well, Skyrim, like, well, how do you think of Skyrim? I said, well, Skyrim is an interesting exception, and this is even from talking to guys at Bethesda. Scope is actually a feature of Skyrim. So when they think about their, their RPG products, scope is actually a bullet point. And it's what you guys, when anyone who loves those kind of games, go, they want it to be big. It's less important that that corner of Skyrim over there, you could go over and the textures don't necessarily match perfectly. Um, it's still, you know, it's still a polished game, but you know, the, the, I don't want to say the polished level, the amount of time that they can put into every square inch of that game is different than the amount of time that Naughty Dog can put into every square inch of their game. But that's because what is important to Skyrim is scope. And so, in, the, in some weird way, and this is maybe the one exception, in the case of, of Skyrim, quality is scope. Um, but normally, that's not the focus. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this, whenever you're approaching a new game, uh, it is, how can you get content into the game? So this is like, someone could say, is this a good tool? It gets it done, you know, but, so the, 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 the the question is with all tools is to really make sure that as much content can efficiently get into the game with as few bugs as possible. That does not mean tools that do 972,000 different things. They need to do the things that they do and do them well and not cause bugs. And that is how a team can be successful. Um, it's why when we look at, um, you know, why again we are able to for a lot of game, games, we can do lots and lots of content with a smaller team in a shorter amount of time. Is because the tools we start off with, or the way that we use the tools, uh, are you know are good, and we try to be very we try to be very smart about how we use them. Uh, so, and this is the other thing. Like, and this happens to us a lot when we're making our games. Is that we're doing great. It's all going fabulously, and I can point to a couple of our games. Of, you know, in, in in certain cases, we're like, hey, it was all going great. And in the end, and at some point, you're just like not in a wonderful place. And you're like, what? Like it was, it was all fine, and I was going to go off on my vacation, and and now everybody's mad and yell at each other, and our publisher wants to kill us, and they're not paying milestones, and it, you know, and so a lot of it all comes down to just because it's going well. And I'm not trying to be like Eeyore with the cloud over or whatever, but but it's just making sure, and I guess this is the double check aspect of all this is that when it comes to making games, it's verifying that what you think is done is actually done. Another way to look at it, and this is what we try to do a lot here at Obsidian, is this idea that if it's, it needs to be on screen. So you can talk about design documents and talk about awesome ideas and talk about this and talk about that. But if it's not on screen and it can't be played, it doesn't exist. And that's really where it becomes to verify. Because when you can review and you can verify it, you can now adjust what you're doing with your schedule, with your game, uh, to make it better. Because ultimately, it's about the player. 
And if you, you need to be able to play your games to, to see if they're going to be good, and then to change them if they're not. And so that's it's just an important part. And the Reagan thing, I guess it's my generation. That was his his whole thing was trust but verify, and that was with the whole Soviets and the nuclear weapons. And, and it works for me. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> yes, good old Ari. Uh, so this is another thing that we get caught up in, and and when we don't, we are successful. And it's going to sound stupid that it's, it's two words moving forward. And, and what I mean by it is that we get to do, uh, you know, we have a lot of conference rooms over here. And we talk, we have meetings all the time. And we're talking about designs. And, you know, we're talking about all the crazy South Park stuff that is in South Park. And, we're, but we're, and a lot of it is, is we start talking. And then we start to talk some more. And then other, someone else has an opinion. And then we talk some more. And we talk some more. And what we're not doing is when we're talking is we're not moving forward. And and a lot of it is, you know, Amazon has, I forgot exactly, Amazon has it a, a, as a part of one of their principles, uh, which is this idea of, of, it's not going forward blindly, that's not what it is, but in the face of there not being a specific, how do I put it, without there really being, a, being, someone feels that it should be A and someone feels it should be B, in, at some point, and it fairly quickly, instead of talking about it more, just pick A or B. Because once you pick A or B, you're going to figure out if, if one worked or not, so you can go to the other one. If in doubt, do. Yes, if in doubt, do, exactly. That's, that's really what it is. And I, and I can see for us, because a lot of times it is incredibly cheap to try something out or hack it in to see if it feels good instead of just talking about it more. Because a lot of it, and, and this is maybe to do with bigger teams, but if you have 15 people in an office, and let's say with overhead, I'm, you know, in general, like how we look, our cost average uh, if overhead and admin is like 10,000 a person, which is $500 a day, which is, I'm not gonna do the math, $60 an hour, and I have 10 people in, you know, if I have 10 people in there, you know, that we talk, you know, for, for an hour and a half, we're looking at $1,000. I don't know if I've done the math right, but something in there. So if you think about it, it's like, just go do it. Go figure it out. And, and you do that by trying, and that helps you move forward. So, so that was a lot of philosophy. Um, and so what I kind of want to go into more of, like, how we think about when we're starting a project. And now this is going to really kind of be RPG-y in some ways, but I think that when you, you, you can apply it to a lot of different stuff. Um, and so the first thing is, what we look at first is we want to make this. We want to make one room. We don't need, we don't need, need to do more than one room because um, we ask the question, is it fun to run around in this room? And does it feel good? Because ultimately, if it's not fun to run around in a room, in any game, in, an RP, in a lot of games, sorry, there's a lot of games that doesn't apply, a room doesn't apply, but, but well, it's not, going to be, it's not going to get better just because you're adding more rooms. It's not going to be better if you add combat or dialogue or slot machines or, or puzzle dragons or whatever, you know. I, it, it, it doesn't, it's not going to make it better. So the thing that you have to start off with is you start with the smallest set of something and make sure that it feels good before moving on. I, it's exciting to move on. It's exciting to build more. It's exciting to add. But what you're generally doing when you're doing that is you're building upon a faulty foundation. And this is what we have done in a ton of our games, is we move on before something is really solidified, which means what we use the term a lot is we use this term debt. What we're doing really is we're just, we're just creating developer debt. We're creating debt that we're gonna have to pay back. And when are we gonna pay it back? So a lot of the idea, and you know, talk, I'll kind of talk about stages of projects in a bit, which I'm sure you're all very aware of, but a lot of what happens with our developer debt is we just are putting that in our bank, sorry, it's not a, as a debt thing we're putting it in our bank, that we're gonna have to pay off during our alpha phase. So instead of making our game better during our alpha phase, we're just paying off our debt. And that's really what alpha is for. That's why Blizzard does an awesome job. That's why a lot of developers do an awesome job, is because they have very long alpha periods where they're actually just making the game better and playing it and you know adding races, taking races away, adding in abilities, all that kind of stuff. And so, but for, you know, and this we've noticed a lot, and I think this happens to a lot of people, if that stage is just getting used to pay debt, you're not doing that. So what do you do next? So, or I'm sorry, I should say, yeah, what do you not do? You don't go make this, because uh, that's not helpful when you're figuring out your game. 
So what do we then do next? This is going to sound real boring, uh, but we make two rooms in a hallway. Uh, and and I, I just sound like boring and that kind of stuff, but something like this really does, uh, it really does sort of answer a lot more questions. So what does this answer? You know, it answers, well, how do doors work? Uh, and most people, not a lot of the people from Obsidian here, uh, but they know that, that I feel doors are the most complicated objects in gaming. <laughs> uh, and uh, and I, I have reasons why, uh, but they are, because they're dynamic objects, which means they may not be lit by the surrounding areas. They block AI. Um, they have to block pathing. Uh, can they be shot through? When they swing open, do they move things or do they go through with things? So there's a list of things about doors. So you have to actually solve a door. You have to solve a corner. You have to solve, again, is it fun to just run around in here and run from here and back? If it doesn't feel good and the camera isn't working, and, and, it just, and, and, and even building that is hard, why are you moving up? So that's sort of the, in a very simple way. Now, you know, probably this is not the, the absolute next step, but a lot of it again, and when we have been successful, we have done this. We have taken our steps. We've gone this, then this, then this. Um, and, and not gone to, oh, now let's build a world. You know, because that's not the answer. Um, now, you know, there probably is a caveat here when it comes to sort of technology building and something like, like if we were to go off and say, hey, we're going to go build Oblivion um, from scratch, we don't have an engine. Of course, you have to answer a lot of technical questions. And the first is, how am I going to build and render a world that is 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers? That is another challenge, and of course, that almost has to be, in some ways, it has to be, be working in concert with this. Um, so there is, that is a caveat to that, but again, I still go back to, if it's not fun to run around a room, you really shouldn't be moving forward. Uh, and ultimately, really what it is, it's this idea of building out from the core. That's the one room. You build up from the core, and you just keep on adding on to it, because you have a foundation based upon the middle, that, is, that can support everything else that you're going to put on top of it. Uh, so I've talked a little bit about <clears throat> tools before. I just wanted to reinforce it. And I'm using Minecraft as an example um, because obviously Notch has made more money than, I don't know, God at this point. <laughs> but, um, uh, but why has he? You know? And I think one of the reasons is because my seven-year-old son can go build battleships that shoot weapons at giant spiders, um, and then he can drop boxes of TNT on his battleship and blow it up, and then he giggles. Um, now, when he's seven, I mean, he's eight now, but when he was doing this, he was seven. Um, I, if I put, yes? Can you convince your son to upload that map somewhere? <laughs> you want the battleship. Uh, so, if I put my seven-year-old son in front of uh, the Crytek editor, the Unreal editor, uh, the GAC, or whatever, he would just go, that would be it. There would be, I mean, he wouldn't even know what to do. He wouldn't even know what to start. It's, of course, we can't, all of our tools cannot be like the Minecraft tools. Like, they just can't be. Like, of course, they need to be more complicated. They need to have a lot more things. But it's an important thing to remember. How, much, how complicated do our tools really need to be? You know, how many things do you need to, because the more, in some ways, we noticed this a lot when we made Neverwinter Nights 2. So from Neverwinter Nights 1 to Neverwinter Nights 2, in Neverwinter Nights 1, uh, you couldn't mold the terrain. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. You had, uh, the tiles were much more restrictive and all this kind of stuff. We're like, oh, wouldn't it be awesome if what we did for Neverwinter 2 is, we'll make it, you can do your own height map terrain, you can light it, and you can do this, and you can do that, and you can have all these tiles, and you can do that, all these kind of stuff. In a lot of ways, what we did is, well, so for those people that are willing to put in the time to, to now really get the Neverwinter 2 editor, they can make amazing things. But to this day, a lot more Neverwinter Nights modules have been made. Now, I don't know about the quality as it relates to like a Neverwinter Nights module to a Neverwinter Nights 2 module, but in the essence, a lot more Neverwinter Nights modules got made because it just wasn't as intimidating, and people didn't have to press as many buttons and things like that. And so it's just a thing to think about your tools Whatever game you're working on, it's like how many features do you designers or programmers or artists, how many features do they really need to make incredible content? Um, sorry, yeah, fewer things. And uh, oh, and yeah, ultimately, uh, you don't have your tools crash. Sounds stupid. Um, but uh, we had to focus a lot on this uh, and, and have it be, 
have it be something that we just always made sure of. And, 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 and more so, I think, with the whole don't crash thing is don't make them easy to crash. Like, I don't mean just like, oh, I turned the tool on and it crashed. I mean, if I give it a wrong texture map or I, I try to load a mesh that doesn't work, instead of an assert or a crash, it should just, it should just go sorry with some, hopefully with some information that explains what the problem was. Um, but don't make tools just so, so kind of a fragile that anything a designer that does with it that lies outside of the expected thing that should occur just causes it to crash. Because that just makes everybody sad. Uh, so the next part, the next part of this is really is you know thinking about what to do, and I guess this is a lot of, of kind of moving out from the core and how to decide what it is that you're doing at any kind of any point in a project. Um, and, and for us, you know, for us, really, the answer is what's the smallest amount of work to answer the most questions? Because that's really again going back to the one room. So if you have a really small thing that you want to make, and it can answer. 4,700 questions about, about whether this worked or that worked, if this was fun, if that graphic actually is, if this tech works or that or this or this tool is gonna actually make that possible, that's what you wanna make. And if it's one room, awesome. If it's a, if it's a, a stage, awesome, yeah. When you're talking about, like, let's say, the one room, the two rooms, mm -hmm. the corridor, are you also considering things like story, setting, characterization? Uh, you know, we don't. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I tell you why, because that is, that's glue. Maybe that's a way to explain it. Because story and characterization, that is what that's what glues that area to another area. Mm -hmm. Right? And at that point, that is actually based, that's usually more based upon uh, and, and maybe, you know, we have we have designers here who've been written writing for games for so long, and so maybe I don't think about it as much. And there's definitely a process as it relates to writing stories and writing area designs and then implementing those. Um, but it's still the best story a game. The best story in the world is not going to necessarily, well, I'm just going to say, is not going to save a game where it feels horrible to run around, horrible to run run, 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 run room. And that's that's probably where I would kind of take it down to. Because it's a game, not a story. It's a game and not a story. I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, so yeah, so, uh, but this is the thing. It really is saying, okay, what is that? And there's other terms, and this is like more global as it relates to a product. You know, there's this idea of the most, the mo the, the minimum viable product, and there's a lot of different definitions of that. You can look up on Google, uh, in, in Wikipedia, and there's like, there's a there's a book about it that's pretty cool. Um, but it's really getting down to that thing of what really is the thing you need to make now to really evaluate whether your game ideas, the content you're making, really is what you should continue to work with. Because ultimately, that's what you need to then go back and go. You gotta verify that really the game that you're making is one that's gonna work. So what other, what other kind of questions do we ask kind of when we get to the stage? And I'll kind of just pop them up over here. Sorry, I'll, I'll actually read some of them because I probably can't probably see all of them. Um, but ultimately, it's kind of it's some of the stuff that I already talked about. You know, it's really what is the core gameplay? Um, what, what is the core, you know, if, if I'm running around in a room, um, I don't necessarily be, need to be able to casting fireballs at that time. And again, you kind of go back to what's more important when you're starting off casting fireballs or running or running. Uh, and to help kind of figure out what is that smallest amount that you can do is, you know, you have, is, is listing what you want to learn. You know, and that can then help feed into what it is that you want it to be. Um, and then this is the thing, because a lot of times we kind of get into these conversations, these like black and white conversations. We say, well, the game has to be done at alpha. And then we go, but not in Glutivia, you know, and, and we kind of go into these things of like being very, but it, it, instead of kind of leaving it to the end of that stage of, and then defining what you weren't going to complete, just define what you're not going to complete up front and then be your own devil's advocate. Like, you know, we could, see, and why we say, hey, it's okay not to have VO done at Alpha for our products because one, a lot of what the VO is going to be is based upon the quests and talking to people. And once and when you actually talk to them, you do the quests, that often ends up being a lot of changes. VO is not something that's easy to change because you have to go back into the studio. So we try to leave VO to the last moment we can before we do it because we want to learn what we, we want to learn if what we've implemented actually works. Uh, the next one is is I think is a real important thing. And I you know sometimes I think this is the example of why maybe smaller projects, particularly student projects, can sometimes fail. 
Uh, and, and I think that's why even bigger projects, and this has happened to us as well, is this idea of, in a lot of ways, having too many people on a project for a specific phase, particularly in pre-production. And so what can happen, I, you know, I see, you know, just because we run multiple projects and sometimes like a project is done, and we're like, okay, we're gonna shoot 40 people off onto this project, and we have a paragraph as to what it is. So suddenly 40 people have to figure out what are they gonna make off of this one paragraph. You know, as you can expect, there's now a lot of wasted effort, a lot of confusion, people's morale starts to get hit because like, and, and then the, the age old question comes up, well, what are we making? And then, and then just and a lot of confusion occurs. I think on kind of more student or sort of uh, side projects that can happen as well, because again, like everyone gets excited, there's this whole big group of people and they're all excited for two weeks. And then after the two weeks, it's sort of like nothing's really getting done, done and people are arguing and going in different directions and, a lot, and that's the point at which a lot of those projects die. Uh, so that's the thing that, again, that we ask a lot is like at each phase, how many people do we really need? And this is not to starve the project, it's actually to help it. Uh, and, and then the last thing, after we go through all that kind of stuff, then we say, we ask the question again, can we cut anything else from this? Uh, because the least we can do really is the focus. Uh, because anything more than the smallest amount, um, it's just why make it now if what we figure out from this phase is going to change what we do from there on out. And so it may have changed that feature, so why do it up front? Uh, so what do we do after that? Uh, we fight. No. Um, so, <laughs> no, really, it goes back to this, and I think this is an important part, is really looking at what we've made, and, and like I said with the picture of Reagan, is really look at it, really, I mean, it's, I think people sometimes use the term group think or people convince themselves it's wonderful because I've reviewed, you know, people kind of show me little projects and they tell me how wonderful, in a lot of ways what people do is they tell me how wonderful it's going to be. And if I just look past this and I just look past that and, and things like that, and, and to be honest, we do that with our publishers. We do it less now, but it's, 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 a, ha it's a bad habit we got into. Ultimately, a, a game is, is only as good and this is back to what I said before, is only as good as what is on screen. And, and that is what you need to review and assess. And, and, and then if it's not there, is it, ask the question, is it ever going to be there? Really ask the question and then adjust. And that's what we try to do every time we go through different phases of our products. So, you know, I kind of have these listed up here. I, I think, you know, a lot of people know these. Um, this is just how we look at it, and I'll kind of I'll kind of do it a succinct you know thing. Prototype for us is to make sure it's core gameplay, but it doesn't need to look be look. It doesn't need to be pretty. It also doesn't need to be done exactly the way that it's going to be. It's more to get a sense of are these ideas good ideas. However, it is also important during the prototype stage, at least from a visual standpoint and on a tool standpoint. I'll, I'll start with visual. On a visual standpoint, to make sure that the visuals you're going to have are what you will have eventually. And, um, and maybe this is less important on non-publisher products and internal products, but I think even internal products with large publishers, eventually someone has wants to see a pretty picture. Um, this is just the life of making games. And, but, but, and I think that's actually how we used to look at it. It was just like, ugh, like the stupid executive producer who wants to see like what the model's gonna look like. He doesn't understand, you know, woe is me, he doesn't understand. It took so long, and it's eventually going to awesome. And why doesn't he trust us? And 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 in some part, he shouldn't trust us because internally, we also need to have that thing that we can shoot for. Like like we're going to make a character look this freaking awesome, and we should have that by the end of our prototype. So then the rest of it, we know what we're hitting, what we're trying to shoot for. And also because I think that puts, that also creates pride in any product that you're working on. Uh, vertical slice. Um, <clears throat> And I, I probably shouldn't put quotation marks for final. Uh, uh, I should just say final. Uh, but you know, ultimately, vertical slice, you probably all know the term. Uh, it really is finishing a part of a project, a, a whole part of, the, a part of the game, so it can be played as if it was final. Now, when this was first told to me, let's say 2005, um, I also reacted like I just did about like the executive producer wanting to see the final character. It's like, why is someone who doesn't know how to make games telling me how to make games? And, 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 and I think more and more as time has gone on, we've realized, well, whatever their definition of vertical slice, and with the A, it was called X slice at the time, uh, that's not, well, well it, we don't necessarily follow that exact 
definition, again, what we found is by, by really making it, we now know how to make the rest of the game. If you have not made the game and know, and know what feels good, how can you go off and make the rest of the game? And that's ultimately what we answer. What we answer. Yeah. With the vertical slice, is that what you would suggest, like, whenever you have to do, like, a demo for E3 or things like that, would, is that where you usually use that? Is that, is that what we use? Um, yes, uh, yes and no. Okay, it, it can be, but it's not necessarily specifically that we would, that we would use that. Uh, the reason being is I think for, for E3, um, sometimes you have to make, a, you know, you have to make a very specific demo for a time, a time period. Uh, most likely a lot of them gets presented. So a lot of the, a lot of the E3 demos that we've done, you actually, you could play it, but it's not really something that would get played. Now, would something like a vertical slide be put on a, put on in a kiosk for someone to play, not as a demonstration? Yes. But that's what I would say. Um, I don't know, though, if I would necessarily have all our vertical slices be the thing, because I think at E3, you still want your vertical, you, you want something even more polished than the vertical slice, because again, you know, this is just the realities of it. Like, because you could say, oh, hey, the game's done at vertical slice, and now we're just going to put in levels. I guess I can fire all the programmers. You know, and, and that's not realistic. You're still putting in features, you're still doing things like that. And so, um, and so it's not done, but it's answered a um, vast majority of your questions about what is the game and how do I make it. Uh, projection's easy. Well, it's easy to explain. It's not necessarily always easy. Um, yeah? Uh, your emphasis on final tools. Can you yeah. talk more about why you want your tools done at that point? In the past, you've always done vertical slides like this, the result is what counts. That you can see the game and the result. Correct. Not necessarily that like, that's how we're going Right. So I guess the thing is, so if your tools are not final, and your tools are what is getting assets into the game, and 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 sort of um, they're what's putting the assets in the game and assigning gameplay values or scripts or whatever that is the actual content that someone is going to play, um, if the tools aren't actually allowing that to happen, then when are they going to be? Which means the first part of production. Are, you're not necessarily making final levels. So, so I guess ultimately the question is, is the tools need to be final enough so that first level that you make in, in production could go in the box. If it can't go in the box because the tools don't let you do it, then, then your tools aren't final and you haven't done vertical slice. That, that's, how, that's how we would look at it. Uh, and then like I kind of said a little bit earlier, alpha, uh, and this is, this is the holy grail uh, for us, really. This is the how to use alpha appropriately. Uh, for us, it is it is about making the game better. Uh, sometimes this does mean making the game bigger. I know I've said a lot of things about you know quality over quantity, but quality is sometimes more quantity. And and if your game is done, and I'm just having discussions like this today uh, with people, if the if the if your game is done at, at alpha, like after production, the game is done. You can now play through it and evaluate and go, oh, cool. Like, hey, it would be this transition between this part and this part of the game would be awesome if there was another three level dungeon here. Well, if your game is done, and, and if a lot of you have kind of worked on big products and also worked on expansion packs, it's funny how expansion packs are so much easier to make than making the full product. And a lot of that is, and if you, in a lot of ways, you look at it, if I could use my alpha period almost like I'm adding an expansion pack into my own game before it ships. It's it just it's it's a whole lot easier. The team is more efficient. The tools are more robust. So it's and again, even in production, we try to look at it as what is the least amount we can make that does make a final game uh, and a full game, so that we can then use our alpha period to make all of it bigger. Which sometimes sorry, all better. Which sometimes means bigger. Uh, and beta, the way we try to hold the beta really is it all that we do in there is just fix bugs. That's all it is. At that point, I mean, we really shouldn't be changing anything uh, because we're trying to get it final and trying to get it out the door. Uh, so, kind of go through some of this a little quickly. Uh, so, deliveries. Um, this goes back into a lot of what we've tried to focus on more recently is this idea that deliveries are about player experience. And you probably, that, again, I go back to my whole one room thing. That's ultimately you're looking at your game from a player experience perspective, not a list of things. Whenever we start focusing on a list of things, because, you know, we don't deliver this list, you know, you don't give someone a box. And go look. Look at the checklist. 
we did all those models, and we made all those features, aren't we freaking awesome? <laughs> um, and because we're like, yeah, but it doesn't work. You know, and that's the thing, that's the mindset we try to kick ourselves back into all the time, is this idea we're not delivering a checklist, we're delivering an experience. Um, and you know, I kind of put this idea of old. So like old, we like, hey, two levels with monsters and traps and this, that, and the other thing, where now we say the player will start on, and it actually, we talk about our deliverables as if the player is playing. And then that even helps us with now what is it needs to be in the game to make that possible. Um, yeah, and then ultimately you do eventually get down to lists. So ultimately the thing, what I guess what I'm trying to say is you don't start with the list, you start with the experience. Uh, here's just, uh, some people ask me a lot about, like sometimes I use the term scheduling and tasking. Um, and a lot of it, the way that I look at it is that sort of once you have what you're trying to make, it's the smallest amount possible, eventually you do it, like I said, you have to turn it into lists. And the way to look at it is scheduling is something you're doing long term, and that has to do with your phases and, and things like that. Tasking is short term, and so uh, you know, and so that's the, that, and, and that's the big way to look at it. Um, and then ultimately, I guess I'm just I'm just repeating myself a little too much here, uh, but I'll, it really comes down to focus on goals and not checklists. Uh, so last thing, so uh, you know, some people ask me sometimes like, hey, you've been doing this for is it 22 years now? Uh, so I started as, as a tester in 91, and I've been in 22 years, and I, I've, I've been very lucky, and I've got to work on some very successful projects. Um, some of them have some of my ideas in them, some of them don't. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, like, what is that secret sauce that keeps you in the industry or helps you make games or what makes great games? Um, uh, you know, so ultimately, I think a lot of people have a lot of different ideas. You know, it's creativity, uh, it's, is it desire, is it IQ, is it knowing games? Um, and uh, you know, I guess like the 20 years experience. So, um, uh, so there's the three of us there uh, that have worked uh, in the industry. That's Kevin on the left from Blizzard. Uh, that was at Bioware. Uh, now he is, uh, I'm pretty sure, working on Diablo 3 uh, as one of the one of the senior designers. Um, it's James Olin in the middle, uh, who's a great director on uh, Swotor on Star Wars. Uh, Knights Row, not Knights, but the other one, Swotor the MMO. And of course, me in my dashing blue shirt. Uh, so I don't believe that's what it is at all. Uh, so this is my stuff. So uh, you know, kind of when I started out, this is what I was talking about. It's it's discipline. It's it's again making sure you have that foundation. Uh, it's staying on target. It's using process. And I know it sounds like I'm almost saying like, oh, creativity, and it's not about this, it's not about that. Uh, no, games are incredibly creative, and I want, and I, I don't want anybody here to to enjoy that part of it. But there has to be the eating vegetables part of it as well. Uh, Communication is incredibly important. And that's again how why big teams need to be split into small strike teams because communication just gets freaking crazy. And so, and it has to be continual talking about not just what we're making, but if we've been successful. That's hard, those are hard conversations. Like that's someone saying, hey, I don't think that's good. And having, now have, of course you have to have, a re everyone has opinions, of course, like that's crap. But, but a lot of it is having a reason and what are you gonna do about it? Uh, and being pragmatic about the games. I mean, I'm sure there's some guy who thinks this is the best car ever, um, but it's being just pragmatic about what is that we do. Again, again, our job is to make games that people enjoy playing. It is not making things that we think are neat. Hopefully they get to be both, they get to be the same. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that go like, well, I want game design to now be this. I want to tell this type of story. I, I, I. And, and you know, and I'm not the stupid I and team crap, but, but it, it's not that, it really is, it is, I always go back and say it to it, it's that kid who downloaded, you know, my, well my son pays a dollar out of his allowance to download the 19th iteration of Angry Birds, and he has a smile on his face, and he wants to be showing me how he's blowing shit up. Uh, he, like, wow, he just had a, he, he's so happy, you know, and that's ultimately, that's, that's our job, is to make people happy, and making new things, making unique things, does not necessarily going to make people happy, and that's just you know, being pragmatic in that way. So, in the end, um, you know, I kind of started to say this a little bit, but I really do believe making games is awesome, and I think it's a blast, and it's a career that I want to continue to do, and but they're hard, and I do believe they're creative. Uh, 
but they're also collective, which that means getting a lot of opinionated, creative people marching in the same direction. And like I said, that takes a lot of communication. Uh, and again, it's eating your vegetables. Uh, it's using process to do it right. Uh, and, you know, I pretty much already said this, but, oh, wow, look at that. Anyways, so, uh, yeah, look at that. I know I just turned lights off. Anyways, so, uh, but ultimately, yeah, so, uh, hey, you know, probably some of you in the room have been doing this for 20 years. Uh, some of you haven't. Uh, you know, if you haven't, I, I, I wish the best for you so you can, uh, because it's a career that I love, and I, I'm, I'm so glad that I've been able to do it. So, thank you very much. Questions while I stand in the dark. Okay. Yes. Um, so how do you, once you decide to make a game better versus make the game bigger, like how do you balance? How do you how do you balance that? And when you decide to do more of So I mean, this is going to sound strange. I mean, some of it just has to do with time. Like how much time do you have to do it? So so the initial thing is is that if all you have if you have to choose between better and bigger. And you and there's no you can't choose both. Like it's better. Like there, that's it. There's no other question. Now the only thing and the, and the, the, the caveat to that is, again, I'm making a game like Skyrim or making an RPG where, where, where scope or the amount of hours of expected gameplay is that's in the player's head. Well, then maybe bigger is the right decision. So that it's, it's almost in certain ways it's really the same question, um, but in a more in a more traditional way of looking at it. If you have to choose both, choose between the both just because of time, you always choose. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on the quality of the features. I'm gonna make it easier to play. I'm gonna make it funner to play. I'm gonna make it, make the experience feel better um, before I add stuff. Even if your audience is asking for more content. Well, uh, yeah. So yeah, this is going up on YouTube, isn't it? Um, so um, how do I? I use my, I use my son as, as a great example for everything. Um, uh, when I ask him about games and what does he want, he doesn't know necessarily know what he wants. He has a lot of things like, oh, I'd like, you know, like, I mean, you know, he's happy, like, he got figured out how to, you know, he had TNT, then he started making nuclear weapons, and that made him happier, right? So, um, but I think it's a, a lot with other people. It's like some of our job, not all of it, believe me, is to... Because if all we're doing is regurgitating what people are asking us to put in our games, now our games aren't moving forward. And that may sound a little counter to what I said is our job just to make people happy. But ultimately, in some cases, just like in movies or books or things that, that you know, the media that we don't work on, I don't want it just to be a regurgitation of something that I've seen before. And the only way that could happen is because someone who it is their profession to do that um, has pushed it. And so that's when we don't listen. You listen a lot, but you can't listen all the time. Yeah. Uh, I feel like a lot of what you're talking about is missing a, a, a key point. Sure. And that is uh, money. Right. So what is the money kind of situation that happens when you start changing what you're operating for? So, uh, you know, actually this is all based upon money in a lot of ways because we're going to develop. So what it is, I get to sign a, you know, a 75-page contract that says, um, uh, and using my son again, no, is, is if I don't deliver this game on time, they get 80, right? So, um, and so the recommendations are here because the money is important. So why I say you don't want to incur debt is because if you incur debt, you're just pushing your schedule out, which costs money. If trying to get to that very core of what your game is as quickly as possible, Again, that is so that you're not going to spend a lot of money before you've figured that out. Now, of course, you know we've made games for $3 million. We've made games for $20 million um, or more. And there is this initial stage, and I, you know, you're right, I didn't include that, which is the initial stage is just being honest about what you can create. Um, and, you know, like you know, scheduling, out the, scheduling out eternity is incredibly different than scheduling out South Park. Um, and so, and what we have to do there is like, how do we smartly use the resources that we have available? Like, you know, with, with Eternity, we have to look at, okay, so we want to have as many creatures as we humanly can, but what's expensive to do when it comes to creatures? Animation is pretty expensive. Multiple rigs is pretty expensive. 
But what's not expensive, well, mesh changes and, and, and scaling and textures and stuff like that, they can start to get expensive. But we can have, and we did this a lot in Neverwinter, is we figured out how to reutilize a lot of rigs in interesting ways where a lot of people didn't even know it's the same rig. Um, and so, yes, you're right. Money is absolutely a part of it, and, but that's where I think it comes in. What is your initial scope and what are you trying to accomplish is where the money comes in. Yeah? How is developing a Kickstarter game different than developing a publisher funded? How is that different? Uh, you know, there's a lot of elements that are the same uh, because in essence, uh, you know, and the team would say this, uh, you know, the owners of the company, there's five owners of Obsidian, we're like the publisher, you know, and we have a budget and they have to deliver milestones and they have to like, so we treat it a lot like the way a publisher game is set up. Now, however, having said that, we are, it is our own thing and we're not, a, it's our own IP and it's our own story and world and all that kind of stuff and so we're not having some outside force, that's probably wrong, some outside group um, telling us, you know, no, make it purple. Now that, that it's giving somewhat of a disservice to publishers because they don't do that. They don't. I mean, they don't come to say, "Oh, just make it all purple." Um, but we're not having to spend a lot of time and effort with a third party convincing them why everything we're doing is right. And that is one of that is cost time. I mean, a, a, you know, if I was scheduling out, a, you know, an internal product versus an external product, um, we would automatically put extra producers on the external product. Uh, sorry, a product we do for an external company, just because we need them to be dealing with our publisher, you know, and and that's not trying to be mean. It's just that it's it's a lot of communication that you have to do. So it's probably the biggest the biggest difference. But we but I guess the the more important message there is we treat it a lot like a publisher thing. We don't just we try to have the same things go through the same stages, have deliveries. We're working on localization. We're working, you know, all that kind of stuff because a lot of the stuff that publishers do is absolutely necessary. How do you make the um, yes, a lot of it's scope, and a lot of it is, you know, particularly with Eternity, I mean, we've made these, it, it, we, so we didn't say, hey, we're going to go make Skyrim for $4 million. You know, we didn't say that. We said we're going to go make a modern Eterni uh, Infinity Engine game, and that immediately created the scope, because we made those back at, you know, Black Isle. Now, it's been many years, but we, we understand what needs to go into there, and, and, you know, the question also about, like, rates and stuff like that. We're being very conscious of how do we get the most content possible out of the, 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 the smallest amount of time. Yeah. I'm trying to wrap my head around um, the whole one room concept. Sure. And, I, and I'm wondering at what point do you know you're ready to move on? Is it that this one room will incorporate all of the core mechanics or that you make this room as fun as possible before extending into other rooms or? So I, I think, so try, so I, in a lot of ways, I can tell you what we did. So we actually started this on Dungeon Siege 3 with that one room. And it was a gray box room. Mm -hmm. Um, the character was a little bit more defined, you know, and he had some textures, but he still wasn't final. And really what we did is we just sort of ran around, like, and just said, hey, does that feel good? You know, we didn't, it wasn't about putting anything else in at that point. And, and, and I guess the best way, to, unfortunately, part of my answer is there's no black and white here. And a lot of it is, is again, is saying, okay, so we've answered moving around in this room. What is the next smallest amount of stuff that we can do that adds, it adds in other things? Like, where do we bring in combat? Like, we didn't have combat in that one room, but we added combat eventually. I can't remember if it was after we kind of added a bit more. We, we probably, it was, it was somewhere between those room, the, the, the two rooms in the hallway and that next thing is when we started bringing combat in. Because we felt, okay, we can get around here and the camera's working and all that kind of stuff. Well, now we can throw a skeleton in there and can beat the crap out of it. Does, he, does that feel good? So it, it, is, it is sort of taking all the stuff that you want and, and kind of looking at all these micro deliveries and spreading all that stuff out and bringing it in when it's appropriate. In the example you just gave of that one room, uh -huh. what made it feel good? Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I hate, sorry, repeating myself. One of it is that the way the camera worked, it felt like a final game. In other words, it worked close, you know, and it did, the, the camera kind of worked and it wasn't doing weird popping stuff. And, and the way that the character kind of, like when we pushed forward, you pulled back and you did this and you did that, like it was doing things that felt good. Like, you know, and sometimes that's different. It's like the difference between sometimes when you play like a 30, a 30 frame per second game or a 60 frame per second game. It has that weird feeling better thing. Um, but that's really what it was, is it was a feeling thing. And that kind of goes back to, again, having stuff on screen as early as possible, you get, you, you know if it feels good. And I wish that, again, that's, that's kind of a, philosophical 
and not specific necessarily. So but it real yeah, but it was really about yeah, did it feel good? Did it feel good? Yeah. How do you know when it's time for the um, when, when you feel that that next step, you said this is the next smallest step that you're gonna that you're gonna take, and you can't get it done in a reasonable amount of time with the people that you have. Now that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, and that's not how teams actually get managed. But ultimately, that's probably the best way to look at it. Is like when you really need because you can't if you have x amount of things that you're trying to do, and it's gonna be. 15 weeks before you can have that thing done, that's just too long. Like what we really look at about our slices of time, you know, early on it's very fast, dates, you know, and but then what we go to is we try to go to slices in which you know, our strike teams are supposed to deliver um, something to play and to see every sort of two and a half to three and a half weeks. And that's the kind of, because we think a month is too long because, oh, it's a month. You know, uh, you know, a few day, a week is too short sometimes. So that's that's kind of what we, what we try to do it. So, um, there's, uh, yes. Um, I'm just wondering what are some tips you would give um, in terms of resolving creative differences or I guess conflicts among your teams. On the teams, yeah. Uh, so it's a very it's a very good question. And that's a challenge. So I, I, there's two two things. Um, one is very important is there has to be a decision maker on, the, on a game. So a lot, like I think a lot of people sometimes feel in a creative endeavor, um, it's, it, it's, it can sort of be group decisions and voting and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, the, you've all, you know, it's a stupid joke, but you know, Obsidian is a benevolent dictatorship. All teams are benevolent dictatorships. Um, that's why we have project directors, because there has to be someone to make the decision. Um, and, and then everyone has to know that the, that's the person that's going to make the decision. And then everybody has to be cool with it. And it also has to be, and of course when you're, when everybody's getting a salary, sort of an understanding of, you gotta listen to the person that's above you. Um, when it's not one of those projects, more volunteer, everyone should come in with this, and I don't, you know, it's interesting, when we start a company, um, uh, you know, you actually, we actually, we actually have these things called the Articles of Incorporation. And those Articles of Incorporation actually say that I'm, you know, every year the board gets together and they say I'm in charge. And that's what the five owners do, whether we really need or not. Everyone understands, and sometimes I'm in charge, I make the decisions, except in these sort of certain things. That doesn't mean we don't argue, and it doesn't mean that kind of stuff. But ultimately, they know that that's what it is. And if they don't want it to, then we can have a board meeting, and there can be a vote and all that. But that's what needs to be happening at the corporate level. So, now a secondary part of that, I, and, and you know, this is where uh, it was a part of what I was saying about moving forward. I think some, some ways to really resolve some of those creative things after it's been talked about for 61 minutes, someone just has to go, just put something in. You know, because it's amazing, like, like, like we have had hours and hours of conversation, and then you ask, like, the effects artist, so how hard will it be put that the, th the thingy thing in the floaty, sparkly <laughs> thing? Um, will you give me two minutes, I'll go put it in. So we just talked about something for two hours that we could have seen if it worked or not with two minutes of work, right? And so I, it's amazing how many creative Conversations about abilities or this or that can actually get resolved. That way. So, take a question. so if you're working on a hardcore RPG, do you have all the members of the team play the game? And if you do, if someone is struggling because maybe they're not the most hardcore gamer, mm -hmm. does that change your design at all? Hmm. Um, if you are making a hardcore RPG, you should you should listen to it. But that doesn't, you have to, it all has to be put in terms to what kind of game you, you're making. Because, like, if their comment is like, if their comment is like, I'm having a hard time getting, using, here's, a, here's a strange or weird example. So, um, years ago we made a game called Icewind Dale, and, we didn't make, and, then, and then we made Icewind Dale 2. Uh, in Icewind Dale 1, we required, both super, obviously, super hardcore RPGs. Icewind Dale 1, we required everybody to create a six person second edition D&D &D game, D&D &D party, before they could even play the game. Like, I'm surprised anybody played. I mean, if you give that to anybody now, except if they're hardcore RPG guys, they'd be like, what is just a stupid guy, a thief, and he's got a D6 plus two, what? You know, and like chaotic evil, and what's his name, and you know, so I mean, it takes, right, like, as a heart, as like, you know, a person who grew up on wizardry, and Bard's Tale, and all that kind of stuff, I love those things. But we found that out, you know, and you could say, well, hardcore people love just create the party, so why would we, we would do anything else? But in 
in High School Deal 2, we created these, these parties. And we, and we created, I don't know, three, four, five of them. And they had, you know, a setup of things, and they had a theme, and they had a story, and they, you know what I mean? And, that, and so people could just pick a party and move into the game. Did that change the game drastically? No, it didn't actually change the game at all. Other than it did allow people who don't want to go through the three hours of generating the six player, six player party, second edition D and D. I guess that was third edition, but that. Um, uh, yeah. So I don't know. That's how I look at it. Is it really comes down to your demographic, and and, and are you is there any feature that you're looking at? Uh, is it is it really taking? Is it dumbing down your game? Like particularly when you're making a hardcore RPG, you have to look at like is it dumbing it down? Is like is your is your fan? Is this going to piss off your normal fan? Like, Megan parties had no effect whatsoever on our normal fan, but if we did something else, it could. So I maybe that's the way to look at it. And then, do you have all members of the team play the game? Yes, we, yes, absolutely. We want everybody to play the game, you know. And yes, not everybody loves playing the game, you know. And so, and and you know, and so my, my hope in the end is like, you know, every designer should have played the whole game if possible, and they should have played their areas until they're they're bleeding out of their eyes, right? Because they need to play to know if the area is good. Um, but do I expect a concept artist who makes the most beautiful pictures, but doesn't, you know, likes League of Legends and, you know, and we're making Zelda, you know? Like, I just wanted to play at least some of it to see if what was in his head about what he thought the game was supposed to be so he could play it. And, and, and some feedback from those people is helpful as well. So, yes? Can you talk about your process of how you got to hire you know, build a team? How do we, oh. So well, the first thing I would say is we try not to hire a team. We don't just say, okay, we're going to make Project X and we we'll just hire everybody. So the first thing is we do try to bring over um, as many people as we can from other projects. Um, not usually trying to take them from projects in the middle and things like that. But then generally, generally we have our projects are ramping up and ramping down. You know, we usually have two or three, like we have three projects going on right now. And so as things ramp up, other things are ramping down and, and stuff like that. So we do try to have a core group of people that we're bringing over. Other than that, um, what, is the, what are the ways that we, how do we look at hiring? Um, I believe, and I think and the other owners here really believe, um, experience plays a real role in, in, in hiring people. But we believe that ability is more important. Um, how we look at it, we want to hire people for the long term. And just because someone has does, does something doesn't mean they're gonna be able to ever do anything else. We would rather hire smart people that we feel are going to be with us for 20 years. That means they need to grow, and they need to be able to adapt, and they need to love games, and they need to, you know, and, and that's kind of how we look at people. And so we we are also very interested in, when, because I just did an interview, we've been interviewing a lot of them, I just interviewed someone today. What's also the way we hire is we want people to ask us questions. We want it to be a conversation. We don't want it to be a confrontation. I've heard from a lot of people, and this is going to sound horrible. Um, I have, in my entire adult life, um, had one interview. Um, uh, and it was when I started to interplay. I walked in, and the VP of operations said, are you Fergus? And I said, yes. He goes, nice to meet you. And then he went back to his work. And that was my interview. Um, and so I'm not someone who's interviewed a lot, so I, a lot of this is just, is just from what other people have told me. A lot of people have said the interview process, a lot of other places, is, is, is almost confrontational. In other words, it's like trying to prove that that person on the other side of the desk sucks. You know, and, and I don't, and none of us here believe that's helpful. Like, is it okay to get on a whiteboard and ask a programmer questions about can you do a dot product? And, and we have had senior 3D, programmers come in here and they can't do a dot product on a whiteboard, right? So it's good to check certain kinds of things when when you're when you when some, and present people with certain problems. It's not to show that it's not to not to try to can show you know to have them appear dumb in front of you. But if someone is is is, is applying for a certain level of a job, they have to prove something. Um, but for the most part, we we really we, we ask very broad questions when we're hiring um, because we just want to. We want to know what people think. We want to know what they're interested in. Um, and, and like I said, we ask them to ask us questions. We like, and, and what I always say is like, I'm not trying to trick you and trying to ask me a question to go, ha ha, you know, you hate puppies. Um, no, it's not that. It's just more like we want them to know us 
because we want it to be a part of their decision making process. Because if they feel that no, they know us, then when they get here, there's no surprises. And I guess that's an important part of our that's an important part of our hiring as well. So, yes, Justin. I'm just saying, uh, we're running kind of late on time, okay. so you probably want to take one or two. All right, any, I think, uh, did you have, you have an ask, have you? No. Uh, I have a very quick uh, question about uh, the industry as a whole. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a CS background, but I've been with uh, both an MBA at some time. Mm -hmm. I hear like the major guy who does it. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what video school, is school ranking important or not? School, school ranking for MBAs? Yeah. What do you, what, so I'll ask, I'm sorry, I'll ask a question. Yeah. Um, what do you want, what is, why do you want an MBA? Like, what's the point of the MBA? Well, um, I like programming. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in essence, you kind of want to learn to how, you know you want to sort of an education in being a manager. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if school ranking even matters in that case. I mean, a lot of it is if you're going to work for if you're going to go work for um, Procter and Gamble, right? And 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 it matters to them that you have got a degree from Anderson School of Business at UCLA, right? Like that stuff matters. You know, I think in the game industry, it's more of you're looking at it as a, I want to get better at management and then kind of move in that role as whether it's a lead programmer or a project director or something like that. What it is, you're really learning stuff to be able to show that in the workplace and transition, if I'm guessing, you know. Um, if you just want to kind of, if you just want to like show up somewhere and go, hey, hire me as, as um, a VP of development because I have management experience now, I would say then, then you know, Without instead of working up to that in a company, then you need the ranked MBA. So, um, just two more questions. Anybody? Yes, Alice. Can you tell us at the time when you were on a pet project doing something, something went really horrible? All projects. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, huh. Let's see. I'm trying. To, so, so what do you see? So, so a specific example of something. Um, yes. Um, don't lower the AP value on the turbo plasma rifle. <laughs> um, so. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I'll actually turn that into an actual parable or something. Um, the. You know, so I was the lead designer in Fallout 2, and so, uh, and, but before that, uh, I was working on Fallout 1, and I was helping get it done, uh, and I did a lot of sort of cleanup design work and a bunch of things while running the studio, which is stupid, but um, the doing the design while trying to run the studio, not the running the studio. Yeah, okay. And so the, uh, and I sort of like, okay, so we wanted to get some last minute quests into the game. And I then made a decision about like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have this new big weapon in the game that you kind of get towards the end, but not all the way at the end. And like we'll call, we already had a, a plasma rifle. We'll call it the turbo plasma rifle because it's turbo. <laughs> um, it's gonna do more damage and you're gonna be able to fire it more. So, you know, so I was 27, I didn't know. I, 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 and so, what I mean, what, what's, so what's the important thing there? Uh, the important thing that what I learned really is to, when you're making a lot of quick decisions about system balancing and stuff like that towards the end of a game, and even in a, in a high role like mine, you get into those discussions at the end of a game because you're trying to tune, you're trying to do this, and you're trying to do that, is don't make a lot of snap judgments. Um, you know, ask the question, look at the spreadsheet, Things like that, and, and that's you know, and, and it went out, and a lot, and, and what I did is I ruined the game for a lot of people because a lot of people went and got that weapon, and now they're just like, you know, like they were just like smearing through combats, and so that was the lesson that I learned, and I certainly never at that point I was like being very careful from then on out when I was like at the, towards the end of the game, not making snap judgments about about kind of changing things that I didn't understand completely. So, yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that when you get to the end of a phase, mm -hmm. you do that review and you ask, was there anything that got done that could have been cut? What do you do when the answer is yes, these are the things that should have been cut? Um, if my bullet point, so I think <laughs> what, I, what, I may, what I think what I meant more of that is, is um, oh, I'm sorry. So at the end of a phase, 
at that point, what it's really, well, I guess what I was really trying to say there is that at the end of every phase is really where you take a hard look at what is the scope of your game. That's really more of what I meant there. Is that, is that does this game need to have everything in it that I said it was going to the last time I thought about it? And that's really what it is. Because again, and maybe this is just us, but I think it's a lot of different games and a lot of different things, is that games always ship with too much stuff. And so, and again, more stuff, it's not just the time to make the stuff. It's the time to fix the stuff, polish the stuff, test the stuff, make sure that stuff is working in conjunction with other stuff. And so when there is when there is just less stuff, it's just it's so much easier to get a game final. So that's what I read. It's just it's just making sure that you're always pouring down to what it needs to be. So anyways, well thank you very much for coming out and listening to me babble for a while. <laughs>